Amazing Grace Commons. That's pretty good given the, where we are today and lots of spaces out there. I just wanted to say it's so good to be with you this morning worshiping, uh, both with you here and online. For those of you that didn't have the privilege of coming in this morning, did you see the flat irons? Weren't they amazing? Man, God's beauty in the midst of a terrible day yesterday. All right. Today is um, the first Sunday of the month. It is that time where we share in communion together. And for those of you uh, that are online, please uh, take the time now to uh, secure your communion elements. Um, for those of you that are online. If you're new, or nearly new, to Grace Commons, or wondering who is this Jesus we worship we would love to meet you at our newcomer's coffee right out that way. For the use of that going, where the heck is Westminster Hall? Out those doors, keep going, go up the three stairs, make a sharp left past the restrooms, and you're there. Okay? Great. Um, and children are welcomed as well. If you're looking for an opportunity to be moved by the Spirit through music, Pianos Alive is for you. It's going to take place Friday night, 7 p.m., so bring a friend to experience five, five, it's amazing to get them all up in here, five grand pianos and up to ten musicians, pianists, playing in unison. It is truly one-of-a-kind concert, and I am confident you will be amazingly blessed by it. All right, and you'll find more of what we're doing as a church right here. So if you want to peruse that, I'd be happy to have you do that. Um, there are so many ways to connect and serve the Lord here at Grace Commons. And finally, in some uh, family news, it is with sadness of heart to inform you that um, our dear sister in Christ, Betty Huff, passed away on Thursday. Her memorial service will take place Wednesday, February 7th at 10 a.m. Look forward to those that can make it. And now, I'm going to take uh, this time now, I think, right, Anthony, to uh, have a special announcement that we've got. Well, it is uh, a special announcement. Uh, if I don't know you, by the way, if you're visiting this morning, thank you for braving these conditions to be here this morning. Uh, just want to echo Steve and say welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, my life changed. Uh, uh, well, it's changed a lot of times along the way since I've been following Jesus. But one of the best classes I got to take at seminary was at the Sundance Film Festival. Fuller Seminary offered a course that uh, was just valuing the art that was coming out there, teaching us how to watch it with a appreciation, and we got to talk about it in community and wait in line to see the films, and it really was a life-changing experience for me. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is that we are uh, going to get to host the Boulder Film Festival, like one of the screenings here coming up. Some of you guys know this. I'll talk more about that in a moment, but what I want to do is introduce you to a uh, a friend of ours, a member of our congregation. I'm really proud of him. I know you will be too, especially if you learn more about what he does. But I want him to speak uh, to you directly. So I'm going to call T.C. Johnstone up here and ask him a few questions. Uh, his wife, Kristen, is on her way up here with him as well, which I'm delighted for because they are in a partnership and they are filmmakers. And I have asked him. This was not T.C.'s idea. I'm just so very proud of what they do and why they do it. And actually, there is a film showing right here uh, in Boulder this coming week at the Dairy. You'll hear more about it in just a moment. But I asked TC and Kristen if they would stand up here and let me ask them a few questions about why they do what they do. And so that, that is just my first question. Okay, so TC, Kristen, they're filmmakers. And I just would love for you to tell our church, why is it that you got into this? Why do you do what you do? Can we first talk about those cool boots? Yeah. <laughs> those are awesome. And the bow tie. And the bow tie. It's like a whole morning. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we got into um, making documentary films about 15, 20 years ago through when I was on staff with Young Life, and it was just a great way to uh, tell stories and bring insight to people and uh, bring light to dark places. And so it became kind of 
next thing you know, one thing led to another, and 20 years later, still making movies. Still making movies. Uh, and Kristen, what is your role in the movie making process, these documentaries? Um, hello. I am, I say, a filmmaker by marriage. Uh, so that's how I got into it. I married this guy. And I'm a producer. I do all the logistics and billing and all that kind of fun stuff. So yeah. I just listen to his ideas a lot. <laughs> so a team effort. I met uh, TC when we were having our, you know, in and out Burgers celebration in the parking lot. We began to talk about his motivation for making films. And I think that was the first time I heard about In the Dirt. Can we uh, put the slide up, guys, of this film? Now, this film is showing Thursday night or Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. This week, right behind REI at our very own Dairy Theater, would you talk about this film, just why you made it, why you're proud of this film? Yeah, we got introduced to the story about, it, this one took five years to make, so we were, um, it's a story of the explosion of mountain biking on the Navajo Nation. And so it's, it, that's the vehicle to tell the larger story of redemption and hope and second chances and kind of a, a story that's happening in our backyard that I didn't really know about. And yeah, and so it, I don't want to give it away. Yeah, so it's kind I don't of want to give it away. That's the Any, deal. Kristen, anything you want to add about the film that won't give it away? Um, uh, it was just a treat, and we both learned a ton. I think it made some new friends, so we're excited to share the, the story. So yeah. thank you. That's awesome. So I have tickets. My family's going to go. Would love for uh, as many of you to go as possible. If you need help with tickets, I'd be happy to help uh, make sure you get some. We thought about doing our own church screening of it, but really part of this experience is you going to interact with the people of Boulder and then after to stick around and listen to the filmmakers, their motivations. So we'd love for as many of us as possible to come support them Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday at the Dairy while tickets last. Now, uh, if you guys would move to the last slide here about the Boulder Film Festival, right after church today in the sanctuary, there are going to be, I mean, sorry, in the chapel, there are going to be people that can let you uh, find out how you can volunteer to help our church host well. We get to actually host uh, some of the films the weekend of March 1st through the 3rd. We, uh, uh, this film festival has been here for 20 years, and I'm so excited that our church gets to host these artists, filmmakers, and the people that are coming into town for this. But I wanted you to hear from an artist, uh, why is this important that our church be connected to it? Well, ironically, before we ever even moved here, uh, we had another film called Rising from Ashes, and it uh, played at the Boulder Film Festival. So I flew in and I came here for a screening and I remember thinking, wow, if we ever lived here, I would want to come to this church. And so it opens a door for the community to see that this isn't just a building that they pass by on their way to work, but it actually, there's a soul inside. But, I, I, you know, when they put that big screen in here and it changes things, it really tells the community that we want to be with you. And it's a big deal. And I've been on the other end of that as a filmmaker. And then we've come to screen films here. We came here last year and saw a friend's film. And I was like, oh, we're going to watch our film at home. Yeah. You know, and that's a, it's a big deal. So definitely volunteer. It, it's being a, a face in the community that matters in my world and Chris's world. That, that's amazing. So please consider volunteering. We want to be the best hosts that we can be. Uh, when you think about it, some people will be in our sanctuary that really have no proximity to a church. And the love and the hospitality that we show these folks can make a profound difference. So right after the service in the chapel, you can figure out just a few minutes on how you can volunteer. But TC, you said something to me as we wrap this up uh, about appreciation for our church, the history of it, the people that have made it what it is. Would you just share with them kind of what you shared with me on Friday? Yeah, I, well, first off, I really like the fact that you'd come over and you just took off your shoes and threw your feet up on the couch and you're like, all right, let's talk. And I was like, wow, I like this I passed guy. the test, yeah. he says. Um, yeah, for, so we travel a lot. And so knowing that you can come home to some place and then it's just the nature of the job is that you end up looking around and going, there's a story here. And then all of a sudden when you see the facts and you see that this church has been around for decades. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think for Kristen and I, the, the reason that this, is, this church is important to us is that we have elders that have carried us for generations and generations. And you've given our generation a shot mm -hmm. to be able to carry it forward. And so I just want to say, I so appreciate looking down. We usually sit up there. That's our tribe up That's there. That's your tribe up there. <laughs> go tribe. And we look down, you see a lot of gray hair, and you go, yes. Yeah. And so I, I appreciate you all, and I thank you. That meant a lot to me. Nobody in the sanctuary is old. 
But if you miss that, not necessarily the office of elder, but those of you who have helped Grace Commons get to where we are now, those that have weathered storms, those that have, have, have kept our doors open through highs and lows and the ebbs and valleys of, of life as a church. And so from TC and Kristen and for me, thank you to uh, all of you who have, who have given our generation a shot to try to reach this town for Christ. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now it's time to step into service and worship together by the call to worship. Let's calm our hearts. Please stand for the call. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. All the names of Jesus, that our knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing together, friends. I will a 
your name is power, your breath and living water. Lord, we come today to worship you, the King of all. Would you fill us by your spirit as we worship you this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, why don't you take a seat and we'll hear from the choir this morning.
Come on down. You're the next contestant. You can bring a grown up if you want. But they're not as fun. Okay. My name's Emily. I think I know most of you. Come on down. Come sit. Come sit. Who walked to church today? Anybody? What? You didn't walk in the snow. How many of you crawled in the snow to church? Oh, man. You guys are a tough crowd already. Okay. Hey, you can't move my notes, silly goosey. You silly girl. What is this? Anybody know? A caterpillar. Does a caterpillar stay a caterpillar for its whole life? No. What does it turn into? A butterfly? What do you think is more beautiful, the caterpillar or the butterfly? Are you conditioned to say that, or do you really think that? Just kidding. Now, to get to be a, ca a butterfly, hold on, sister. To get to be a butterfly, what does the caterpillar have to do? Turn into it. But how does the, how does the caterpillar turn into a butterfly? Yeah. It goes into a cocoon. It goes into a cocoon, also known as a chrysalis. Look at what I have here. I have more pictures for you. Do you see? Here's the caterpillar right there. And then in the middle is the cocoon or the chrysalis, and then it becomes a butterfly. Now, what does the caterpillar do while it's in the cocoon? It changes, but how? Anybody know? I think it just sleeps. Does it kind of just do nothing? Well, how does that happen? How would a caterpillar just sleep all the way through winter or whenever and then become a butterfly? Because God created it that way. Isn't that amazing? Now, I wonder about this. I just, I'm going to have my butterfly for funsies. So somehow it goes from a cocoon to a butterfly and all it does is sleep because it's one of God's creatures who was made just like that. Did you know that because God loves us, he sent his son Jesus so that all we have to do is believe in God and have Jesus and we are changed from people who do stinky things and make mistakes and be really silly, and well, silliness is good, isn't it? Somebody's got to be silly. Anybody silly right here? Oh, you guys are asleep. What is going on? If we believe in Jesus, God helps us do all that work to go from caterpillar to beautiful butterfly. Isn't that amazing? You guys are loved by God. And you will become beautiful in his eyes with his help. Can you say, yeehaw? yeehaw. Woohoo! Jesus does it for us. Okay, you guys, we have got to take you upstairs and wake you up a hot minute. All right, I'm going to say a blessing over you as you leave. And church, I would love for you to extend your hands and say this blessing with me. May the Lord give you all curious minds to learn, soft hearts to grow, and ready feet to be like Jesus wherever you go with God's help and grace. May you know how loved you are by God and by your church family. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go party. Come on, up the aisle. Let's go wake up a little bit. Just glad those little ones are here. Uh, I myself drove a two-wheel drive Suburban up to Colorado, and I'm realizing that that was not the most helpful thing on a day like this. 
Uh, so we were reduced to one car this morning, uh, needless to say. So thank you guys for making it. Again, let's uh, shift our attention to the Word of God as we open it up. Let's be reminded of what it is, and let's recite these words together. Would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? And we are going to recite what I call our scriptural affirmation of faith. This is just a reminder to us all about the authority and inspiration of the Bible that is a gift to us, that came to us from God himself. Let's read these words. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen. You can be seated. Well, the University of Notre Dame, as you guys know, is a prestigious university. It's not only a great place academically, but they also have a very historic football program. I believe since the late 1800s, if you count kind of the uh, national championships way back then, they've won 11 national championships total. Guys like Newt Rockne, Era Parsegian, Lou Holtz, Frank Leahy, these guys won titles and they are legendary. This is one of the programs. Uh, when I was a college football coach in my early after college career, uh, my dad took me to a game. I got to see the University of Texas play at Notre Dame. We got a locker room tour, got to touch the play like a champion sign, got to walk through the campus as the players came out of chapel and just saw what a special environment this was. And as a young coach, I was uh, just kind of in amazed and enamored with the program and all of the prestige. I remember seeing Touchdown Jesus. We sat in the opposite end zone where I could see Touchdown Jesus in the background. Um, anyway, amazing place. Well, not that long ago. I'm not going to name him. You can go look it up if you're really fascinated by the story. They hired a coach who had lived his whole life to be the head coach at Notre Dame. And I... When I was a young grad assistant coach, sometimes I'd work 20-hour days, not, not exaggerating. We'd go home sometimes at 2 a.m. and have to be back at 6 a.m. This is a line of work that requires lots of labor. And so I, when this coach got the job, he was in his mid-50s, I can only imagine the labor that he put in to earn the job of being head coach at Notre Dame. And usually you get four or five years if you're hired to be a head coach at a university to prove that you belong. Well, this guy didn't get four or five years. In fact, he didn't even get three years, or even two or one. In fact, he didn't get to coach 10 games or five games or even one game. He made it all of five days as the head coach. Resume snafu. He had lied about something on his resume or so the university alleged. That's a strong way of putting it. He says, I didn't even remember that it was there. Uh, said he played college football and he didn't. Said he had you know, worked at a certain school and he hadn't. Five days. You work your whole career. Everything lines out. You get to coach in that stadium, all that prestige, and they dismiss you after just five days. I started thinking to myself when I saw this, I mean, you've worked 35 years to get this job, and all of a sudden, uh, it's, you know, the rug is pulled out from under you. Um, resume. A problem with the resume. I started thinking about my own resume, and that's the one I turned into Grace Commons, actually. I know you can't see it really clearly. It's not important. But when I applied for a church job before this one uh, at my church in Albany, before I did so, Dallas Theological Seminary has a great service that will edit your resume. And I remember them telling me, there's a problem with your resume. You name drop too many people. Like, you quote all your heroes and all these pastors and all these people, but I don't think churches care about what other people say. I think they want to know what you say. So I wouldn't turn in this resume, and I was thankful for that. Well, I have a very serious question uh, to ask you this morning. What if when you get to the end of your life and you stand before God, what if there's a problem with your resume? That would be, I can't think of a bigger tragedy than heaven turning you away because there's a problem with your resume. Now, I do realize that some of you are either not of the generation where you ever had to write a resume, and I do know that there are some young people here, my children, for example, maybe even some college students that have never had to write one. Your time's coming. And so I thought about a couple other illustrations. One time, 
my grandmother bought Dallas Cowboys tickets and they were gonna play the Arizona Cardinals and my whole family was gonna go. And we had this tradition after church, we'd go to her house, have a meal, and we sat down and the kickoff happened, the Cowboys were gonna play and we were all thinking, man, next weekend it's gonna be awesome when we get our turn to go see the Cowboys play. And then we realized they were playing the Cardinals that Sunday. And then we all looked at each other and went, isn't this the game that we were supposed to be at? And she had miscalculated her dates And so those tickets were not going to get us into the event. Nowadays, even more seriously, I would think, Taylor Swift, what if you bought counterfeit tickets and you're all excited and you show up at the door and they say, I'm sorry, there's a problem with your ticket. Guys, the text that we're going to look at today uh, is going to ensure that you never have that problem, that this very serious issue that I've raised this morning about being able to get from this life to the next life with no resume snafus. Uh, It's a very, very important text for us to examine. Uh, This is what I would say um, would be, these are greatest hits albums. This would be, in my estimation, in the Apostle Paul's greatest hits of chapters written, and he wrote a lot of them. You know, when an artist like these guys put their greatest hits album together, Uh, I started thinking, honestly, if I had to list my Apostle Paul greatest hits, I would say this one would be number one. And I I know that could sound like an exaggeration because I love all scripture, but there are certain points that um, where you say, man, this one surely in his greatest hits. And the reason it's in the greatest hits is because it so powerfully explains to us, uh, you might think of, of, of Curly, Uh, who said, you just need to know one thing in life. This is Paul reducing all that we need to know to just one thing, the most important thing that can be on our our Christian resume. Let's open up our Bibles. I'd like for you to open up an actual Bible to Philippians chapter 3. If you're at home, I just want you guys uh, to know that you're welcome. I'm really glad you're listening always have a Bible handy because I'd love for you to understand that if I do well in these moments, I'm just being faithful to the text. I'm just being faithful to what God's word has to say. And I want to separate the screen from this Bible that I'm holding. This is the thing that we need to listen to. Philippians chapter three, certainly in the greatest hits of of, of all the things that the apostle Paul wrote. Here's what it says. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are of the circumcision, we who serve God by a spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, bold statement here, faultless. Verse seven makes a shift, this word, but, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss. For the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is found through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. That's in his greatest hits. I am persuaded. Let's roll through this so we make sure we understand what we uh, have read. Now, the title of this series has simply been, he is him. He's in a category all by himself. He is him, meaning there's nobody else like him. And the title of today's sermon is just simply knowing him, knowing him and the importance of it. Uh, And so just notice here, further, my brothers and sisters, 
Rejoice in the Lord. Notice it doesn't say rejoice in your pastor. Rejoice in your church. From prison, Paul says, no, rejoice in the Lord. That's what I'm doing from a Roman prison cell. It's him that I want you to rejoice in. And notice this word, safeguard. He said, you're going to have to forgive me if I write the same things to you over and over and over again. Um, Somebody joked with me last week uh, when he was introducing me to somebody. The pastor may repeat himself often, but I won't. It was just a problem that we have. Sometimes we might, you know, repeat ourselves over and over again. Well, the Apostle Paul made no apology for repeating himself. He said, some things I'm just going to remind you of over and over again because it's a safeguard. This is the image that came to mind. When you go to a bowling alley and you put those little bumper rails up, you're just trying to encourage a child that's not really ready to bowl. You're trying to keep their ball from going in the gutter. Well, the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm going to repeat this and repeat this and repeat this, this text, over and over because it's a safeguard to you. It's going to keep your life, even your soul, from going into the gutter for eternity. Like this is the one thing you have to know. This, what's in this text, has to be on your Christian resume. It's really the only thing that needs to be on your Christian resume. He says, I need you to watch out for the dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. Now notice verse 3, for it is we who are of the circumcision, we who serve God by a spirit who boast in Christ. Uh, I put no confidence in my flesh, though I have reasons to do so. Now, the image that came to mind, why does he use the image of dogs? Because a dog can go rabid from time to time. And who he's referring to here are people, he calls them those that would mutilate flesh. There's no easy way to explain this other than to talk about adult circumcision. In the Old Testament, I want you to understand, because the power of Paul's words here are pretty amazing. He says, we are the circumcision now. We don't have people, we don't mandate adult circumcision. That would be mutilating the flesh. It's not necessary. But what was happening in the Old Testament, the reason why God instituted circumcision is he was trying to do something symbolic. I'm sending Jesus, my my Christ, into the world through a certain flesh and blood, the Jews. They They are gonna be consecrated for me. And and the reproductive system of the Jews is going to bring the Messiah into the world. Now, when that happened, we no longer, in order to make people Christians, need to demand that Gentiles, those not born Jews, get circumcised. And Paul says, so unnecessary, mutilators of the flesh. He says, listen, now we are the circumcision. We the church. Meaning, now it's us that's set apart for the glory of Christ. We live out the circumcision, what it was intended and pointing forward to. And people, he says, some of these uh, people that are teaching are, are like rabid dogs. They're just trying to devour people into a, a Christianity that is not what he is going to describe next. It's about one thing alone, and we're getting to it. And so moving on. He gets to his resume. That's why I've used this image of resume. He begins to, to, you would think, boast about his resume, but he does it for a reason. Now, all of that, uh, we already read it, so I won't read it again. He, he boasts uh, in a way to make you know, little of his resume, but he does say, if anyone thinks they can go toe-to-toe with me on the power of a resume, I don't think I would lose if it were a competition. And I started thinking about this. I'm going to use a Republican and a Democrat, just so you don't think that I'm being partisan here. And I want to say this because it's not my job to delve into politics. And so if ever I mention it, I'm going to mention a Republican and a Democrat so that you don't miss the point. But because we're talking about resumes, I began to do research on who people have said are the most qualified resume presidents ever. One Republican, one Democrat. So who am I? A Yale graduate decorated Navy pilot in World War II, head of the CIA, vice president, all before he was president. This would be George H. Bush. There's his portrait in the White House. Now, this guy was a Harvard graduate, decorated Navy lieutenant, World War II, served in Congress and the Senate. I'd say both these guys pretty qualified for the office by their resume. Most people would agree. That would be JFK. Love that portrait. It was, you know, obviously done after his death kind of captures the sadness of what America went through there. Now, Paul is basically saying, I mention these guys because he says, I was qualified for what I did. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Jews did that. 
I'm, I'm a true Israelite. I was born of the tribe of Benjamin, 12 tribes in Israel. I'm from one of them. I can tell you who my family tree is. A Hebrew of Hebrew, even a Pharisee, that's like being a congressman or a senator in those days uh, because the spiritual leaders were also the political leaders. I was zealous, meaning I was a patriot, like those guys that were in the military that we just talked about. Persecuting the church, meaning I was qualified because sometimes you serve in the military to fight villains. My villains were Christians and I killed them. So I had prestige from my peers. It doesn't say it here, but he studied under a guy in another portion of scripture we find that Paul studied under a guy named Gamaliel, who was a legend. So he had even went so far as to say, if we were measuring obedience to God's word, you couldn't find fault with me. Now that's a bold statement. And so what does Paul say about his resume in the end? Why does he mention all of this? I have this picture up here because remember when he was governor of California, everyone said, wow, when he had a lot of favor, everyone said, well, maybe he'll run for president. Why couldn't he? He lacked the resume. He wasn't from America. Paul said, I didn't have that problem. I could have had the highest office. He was on his way to being the high priest in Israel, okay? So you need to understand what he's saying there and why he's saying it. And where does he get? He gets here. All those gains I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. In fact, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them. It's really not a good translation in the NIV. He doesn't say garbage. He really talks about animal waste. That's what I did with my resume. Just, it's, it was, it's like waste to me. Not that it's like waste on its own. It's like waste to me if you're asking me to compare it to Christ and what it's like to know him and be found in him. I, I, I loved this image because it's like his resume is on the right side, that stone that's up in the air. If I were to weight these things, knowing Christ outweighs everything to Paul. And everything else that I did and, and seemed to achieve is like refuse. Now, I put a picture of Richard Nixon up here because he knew what it was like to lose what he had worked for, right? I don't want to get lost in this image, but when he walked in a room, I've heard you know, people say that kind of an outcast after his scandal. I mean, Duke, law school graduate, you know, served in Congress, becomes president of the United States, and now when he walks into a room, nobody even wants to identify with him. Now think about Paul. In his early life, there goes Saul of Tarsus. Wow, to be like him. Educated, ascending, there goes the man. Now, by the time we get to our text, the flesh has been ripped off his back. He's got a criminal history record in the Roman Empire this long because he keeps going to jail and keeps getting beaten. And his peers, the ones that once sang his praise, Saul of Tarsus, there he goes. <laughs> he says, whatever I had that was a gain, I'm content, more than content, to have lost it all. He knew loss, friends. He had lost his money. He lost his prestige, his education meant nothing. All the, the ways that he was ascending, he says, it's in comparison to Christ, none of it's gain. The only thing that I would consider gain is him, knowing him. And we get to this word, knowing Jesus in the text. I would contend, just my opinion, there's no greater Greek word than gnosko, and it appears here several times. Gnosko just means intimate friendship, knowing somebody in an intimate way. He says, all I really want, when it's all said and done in this prison cell in Rome, all I really want is to know him. There's nothing else. Just knowing him, there's no greater thing. In fact, I consider everything a loss in comparison to gnosko, knowing Christ. Let's see, I've lost all things in order to do that. And then he says, he talks about righteousness. All that faultlessness that I had, it did not make me right in the eyes of God. The thing that made me right was knowing him. And so friends, here's the kind of finale of the sermon, just one point today. Just realize that a relationship is what makes your resume righteous. 
I need you to know that. I need you to know that when you stand before God, there's really only one thing you need to know, like Curly said. And the one thing is that gnosko Christ while there's time. Know him. Be in an intimate relationship with him. Trade everything. Lose everything if you have to, to know him and be found in him. Paul elaborates and says, I want to know him, not just know him. I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want my life to change. The same power that got him up out of the grave, I want that power. And I don't just want to know him. I want to know him in his sufferings. And that's why we're going to go to the communion table in a moment. He says, if I have to be alone, if I have to be flogged, if I have to be single, if I have to be poor, if my reputation has to be squandered, it's okay. I just want to know him in his sufferings. Friends, that's a Democrat and a Republican. I'm not even going to tell you which one I'm talking about here, but this is pretty cool. That's Woodrow Wilson and Ronald Reagan. Did you know seven of our 46 presidents were Presbyterians? It's pretty cool. Both these guys, Woodrow Wilson and Ronald Reagan, affiliated with the same denomination that you do, historic Presbyterian faith. It's cool. So I won't tell you which one, so you don't think I'm making you lean one way or the other, but it, it is a great story that summarizes everything we're talking about, and then we'll experience the Lord's Supper together. So they asked one of these gentlemen when he was running for president, if you died tonight and you stood before God and he asked you, why should I let you in, what would you say? And the president future president, couldn't believe he was asked such a personal question, um, that you can't really hide your theology when you're asked that question that way. And so the future president thought about it for a moment, took a step back, teared up, and he said, here's what I would say. I would say to God, you should not let me in because I've done nothing to deserve it. He said, but... I would point at the Son of God, and I would say, because God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I'd cast my lot on the Son of God and say, because I know him, I think I can come in. Friends, that's all that needs to be on your resume. If you know that, you know it all. If you know him, you know what you need to know to get from this place to the next. Everything else is a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, your Lord and mine. Every week we've been saying in the call to worship, one day, whether you like it or not, all 46 presidents will bow their knee before him. Do it now, not then, for the first time. That's what Paul is calling this church to. Know him. Don't ascend in righteousness. It will get you nowhere. The only thing you need to know is to claim the righteousness that is from Christ. And this table represents it, friends. This is the table that we come to. Um, that's basically how I would transition us to the table. Maybe some of you, as we go to the communion table, need to update your resume. Meaning, maybe you need to just pitch the one that you have in the trash and say, you know, I almost had you take out a sheet of paper and write on it, here's your resume, I want to know Christ. It's really simple. Relationship over religion. Relationship with Jesus on your resume, that's all we need. Now friends, when I was, uh, uh, the, the musicians, you guys can go ahead and come up and as we transition to this communion table, which is something we get to do only 12 times a year. Let's move this, Joe. Um, I grew up in a home and I had the privilege of watching a dad that took this table very serious. The Bible says you don't come flippantly to this table. The Bible says, Paul writes this, a man must, man, woman, child, whoever is going to experience these elements, you examine yourself. Meaning, Jesus did something for us. Part of what Paul says in that text, I want to know Christ in his suffering. Jesus, the right reality is, he hasn't asked you to do a whole lot. He has asked you to do this in remembrance of him. And for us to remember that he suffered in order for us to turn in our resume in heaven. One that says, I know him. And I can come into heaven, not because I earned it or deserve it, but because of what he did. On his merits, that's what makes me right before God. But I used to, as a child, I would watch my dad and he would literally weep at when the elements would come around because he was so deep in examination. 
And the Holy Spirit, I could just see him having these encounters that were so reverent and intimate. So friends, the reason why we give you time as these elements come around is to personally pray for the Holy Spirit to do something in you, a work of examination. He may lay something on your heart that you need to turn away from. He may lay a reconciliation that needs to happen in your life and your family and your set of friends on your heart. Whatever he does, may he do it. So friends, this cracker, unleavened cracker, they are gluten-free, by the way. These elements that come around represent a Passover meal. For the last time, Jesus said, on the night he was betrayed, he said, take this and do this in remembrance of me. This bread that comes around, it represents the body of Christ, which was given in love for you. So we have people that are gonna bring them to you. You just sit where you are and, and just have a personal prayer time. And friends, uh, when you get your cracker, just hold it because we're all gonna eat it together. So just have some personal time with the Lord. Just know that these elements represent the body of Christ. No bones were broken, but his body was physically put on the cross in order to atone for our sins, the body of Christ given in love for us. Matthew 26 says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Grace Commons, let's take our cracker and eat one as one as a church family, the body of Christ given in love for us. For there wasn't just unleavened bread involved. There was also a cup. I love how this is worded. Then he took a cup. Now the cup in the Old Testament was the wrath of God. It's a reference to the right wrath of God. In Jesus, it says he took the cup, meaning he was taking on his suffering, saying, I am willing to absorb the wrath of God in order to exonerate you, my friends. And so 
that is implied here. He took a cup. He took it, willingly took it. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So we're going to do this the same way, friends. When the cup comes around, just grab it, say a prayer. And when we all have our cup, we'll drink it together. Remember, this cup represents the blood of Christ shed for you and shed for me. Would you stand with me? Jesus said, after the words I just read momentarily, uh, just a moment ago, he said, I tell you, I will not drink from the vine or from the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when we drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. When my brother left for Iraq as a soldier, my dad told him we're not eating Mexican food until we all eat it together. And I said, come again, Um, because in Texas, it's really good. Uh, but he was referencing this verse. He said, if Jesus can hold off on the meal until we all get there together, I can do that. That's part of what he's saying. This meal tied you over. This meal is a promise of a greater meal. Let's drink to the blood of Christ and what it guarantees us together. Let's sing our faith together, friends.
Let's remain standing as we sing our final hymn together. I love that we just sang a song about consecration. It reminds me that you are the circumcision now. 
those set apart to follow Christ in the world. So let's leave this place and do just that. But make sure as you do it, you've updated your resume. I want to know Christ. Let's leave this place and ultimately let's do that. Just want to mention, if you need somebody to pray with, my friends to my left here would love to pray with you. Simply just come over here to my left and we have prayer partners. If you brought your offering this morning, your gift to God to keep ministry functioning in this church, there are little boxes in the back where you can drop off your offering. Remember, I'm holding your bulletin because it has a little card at the bottom that we'd love for you to turn in because we want to know who you are so we can follow up. And last, we, we do have some classes that are going to go on at 11. There's a newcomer's one uh, that if you're visiting Grace Commons or if you just want a class to dialogue about your presence here and why you matter and, and just things about the church, there is that one in Westminster and there are other great courses that are going on now. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, the Boulder um, Film Festival volunteer quick meeting is in the chapel right now. So friends, leave this place and know Christ. Amen.